Let's sing Holy, Holy, hymn number 73. is taken from Philippians 2 verses 5 to 11 and I'm reading from the New King James Version. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation taking the form of a born servant and coming in the likeness of man and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the, the name which is above every name. To that, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The church is called to worship. Let us pray. We welcome your presence, O dear Heavenly Father, in our midst today. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who have given us the inspiration, who have given us the motivation, and who have given us the call, O Lord, to be part of this wonderful church of yours. And so, Lord, may it be that through the presence of your Holy Spirit in our midst today, that we would learn more about you and we would learn of your will and your plan for each of our lives. Continue to work through our hearts and minds, O oh God, because this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning, Good morning, church, and happy, happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Okay, that's better. On behalf of the treasury team, we would like to invite you to the Stewardship Emphasis Day at Leicester Central. The essence of stewardship is recognizing that God is our creator and the giver of everything what we have. When people hear the word stewardship, we think about money. But stewardship incorporates the correctness, the correct use of our time, our talents, and our material resources in a manner that honors God. So we are privileged to have as our guest speaker with us for the whole day, Pastor Todd Frias. Uh, Pastor Frias is the South England Conference Stewardship Director. I have to say, it was around this time, 2019, that we had Pastor Frias back with us. In my recollection, that was the coldest Sabbath that I have experienced in Leicester Central. Those of you who were there, just go back for a moment. I know it might be painful. But it was the Sabbath when our boiler was being fitted, the old boiler system was switched off, and we were waiting for the new boiler system to be switched on the following week. And
and it was cold. We had heating or heaters, portable heaters, but they didn't, the heat just went up there. And I could see my breath in the air. Now, last week, Kiana was saying how cold it was. Yes, it's cold, but it's not as cold as it was that Sabbath. Pastor Frias, well done for coming back. We want to assure you that it's not always that cold in Leicester Central. In fact, we hope that you feel much warmer physically, but most of all, we hope that you will feel the warmth of the fellowship here at Leicester Central today. Um, we look forward to your ministry with us both this morning and this afternoon at 2.30 for our afternoon program. So to all our visiting friends and to those who are watching online, we say welcome. If you're here for the first time, just give me a wave. Just give me a wave. If you're here for the first time, welcome. Welcome. We're really pleased to have you. I believe we're expecting, if they're not here, a group from Birmingham who is joining us to participate in our worship this morning. So you are welcome too. May we all feel the presence of God as we worship today. I'm going to ask our praise team to come forward and make sure that everybody is welcomed. We're going to sing our Leicester welcome song so nobody leaves here today without a Leicester Central welcome. Happy Sabbath, church. Let's welcome each other and let's shake his hand. everybody again hopefully by shaking our hands we felt the warm of the others hands and you know we feel welcome and warm it's very cold this morning for the whole week and for our praise and worship we'll, let's start our service with lots of songs let's all be you know happy because we're here at church and we're praising God so for our opening uh, for our part of our praise um, songs let's open our hymn to 220, which is when he comes. Sounded when he comes, we shall hear the trumpet sounded when he comes. 
when the alleluia swinging to the skies with the alleluia swinging to the sky we shall hear the gospel's glory we shall see the lord in glory with the alleluia swinging to the For our next song, let's sing, Jesus is all the world to me, 185. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Hymn number 108, 108.
For our opening song, may I request everyone to please stand and sing hymn number 27, Rejoice Ye Pure in Heart. reading this morning comes from 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. We're privileged to have a, a special item for our garden prayer song. Um, he's a visitor. He came from Birmingham. So um, let, us, uh, let us all welcome Brother um, Nielsen Clifford. I, I now know what I did not know them. I know beyond guessing, wishing, and hoping. I know who Jesus Christ is. Amen. 
He is the bridge of mercy between my sin and God's holiness. He died on the cross for every one of us who has ever let him down. For the self-righteous Pharisees who could not understand his grace. For the mockers, thrill-seekers who came to the cross just to see him suffer. But for me, his friend who denied him when he needed me the most.
Let us pray, church. Almighty God, you are a gracious Father clothed in majesty. You are mighty, yet you save us with mercy. Almighty God, you are an exquisite creator with, with hands that cover beauty. You are author of life, yet you give us such freedom. Almighty God, you know each of us intimately. Your heart is full of love, yet you, yet you watch over us in our weaknesses and guide us daily. You are Prince of Peace. We draw near to you and drink in the promise of eternity. Father, we walk with you and seek your guidance as we learn to be more loving. We are in your sanctuary, Lord. We are safe, safe to let down our guard and dwell in your truth. Yet there are many, Lord, who have not been able to be here today. There are many, Lord, who are struggling right now, carrying so many burdens, Lord. Father, you know each and every one of us. Touch each and every one of us right now, Lord. Lord, we humble, we humble ourselves, Lord, and ask that we are sinners. Forgive us for where we have fallen short, Lord. And there are many, Lord, in these end times who are struggling right now with jobs, with food, with even places to live. There are many struggling to keep warm, Lord. But we ask that your word, Lord, and what you have said, it is written, Lord, that we must trust you. We must seek you and we will find you. Lord, in your sanctuary today, we are gathered here, Lord. There are many who are in the hospitals, there are many grieving for their loved ones. There are many struggling with finances, Lord. But also, Lord, us, even as a church, Lord, we have been shown things this week, Lord, and we, as a church, Lord, have our desires of how we can move forward as a church, Lord. We put those plans to you, Lord. Guide us, Lord, lead us, and if it is your will, Lord, you will make those things happen for us, Lord. And, Father, we have our speaker today, Lord, who has traveled far, Lord. We are grateful that he has made it here, Lord. Bless him, Lord. Touch him in a special way. May the Holy Spirit feed him all the things, Lord, that you want him to share with us, Lord. And, Lord, reason, Lord, you came for the needy, the poor, the oppressed, the forsaken, and those that society has forgotten. Reason, Lord. Your life renews our hearts from within. Thank you that we, we carry your promise of forgiveness. Risen, Lord, we ask for your spirit to work through us as, we, as um, Pastor Frias ministers to us, Lord, and share, our, share your love with all. Almighty God, Prince of Peace, Risen Lord, we dedicate our lives to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Is there a place specified in the Bible to where we should bring our tithe and promise, regular and systematic offerings? Leviticus 17 verse 5 gives instructions about the appropriate place to offer sacrifice in ancient Israel. This is so the Israelites will bring to the Lord the sacrifices they are now making in the open fields. They must bring them to the priest, that is, to the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting and sacrifice them as fellowship offerings. There was a central place to give, with no provision for alternatives. One may legitimately ask why the place was so significant. Interestingly, the text focuses not only on the place, the tent of meeting, but also on the one who received their tithe and sacrifices, the Lord. For the Israelites, the tent of meeting was the tabernacle of the Lord, the place where the Lord resides. Besides providing for an equitable distribution of funds for religious purposes, the restriction about the place had to do ultimately with whom they were worshiping. 
Relocating the place where they brought their sacrifices was typical of idol worship at the time. God designated one place for sacrifice because he wanted to be the sole object of their worship. The appropriate destination for tithe and regular offerings remains a frequently asked and debated question today, but the example of King David provides us with an answer. I will come to your temple with burnt offerings and fulfill my vows to you. Ellen G. White applies this principle to God's people today. The time has come when the tithes and offerings belonging to the Lord are to be used in accomplishing a decided work. They are to be brought into the treasury, to be used in an orderly way, to sustain the gospel laborers in their work. She specifies the place as the church treasury with the appropriate agency to support God's mission. However, this does not remove our social responsibility toward the poor and needy. We should apportion special donations for this purpose. Today, we have another opportunity to bring our tithe and regular offerings, also called promise, to God's church. While we worship at God's designated place, let us choose again to make Him the sole object of our worship. May we put our desires last and God first. Tithes and offerings. Our scripture reading comes from 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 to 7. I will read from the King James Version, and it says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Am I right that this week we all experienced the blast from the Arctic? I can see all the jackets are out. We had to look for them. And I'm sure during the week, if you're waking up like me to go to work in the morning, you had to look for that de It was somewhere in the house, but you couldn't find it the first day. And the scraper, which was in the car, and you couldn't find. Fortunately, all of us are sitting comfortably here because as a church, in 2019, when Pastor last came, before lockdown, you remember lockdown? That's a long time ago. We invested in a boiler. The appeal today is for each, one, uh, each and every one of us to be a cheerful giver by donating what we can, especially this month when even the world says it's the season for giving. There are envelopes like this, which you can find at the back, or you can ask the deacons and deaconesses, and you ask the treasury team, or which, uh, the people behind me and the pastoral team, your donations can be in any currency, coins, and banknotes. Did I say any currency? Yes, I did. Those euros you are keeping for your next trip to Europe in the summer, we can have them to help out. The, those US dollars you are keeping, saving for your next trip, like my fellow Zimbabweans, we know when we go home, we keep all the, U, uh, the US dollars can we have some to put into our, 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 into our box? Any old British and Irish money? Yes, you can put any currency in, the, in these envelopes towards the boiler fund. This means everyone has an opportunity to contribute towards the import, uh, this important fund so that we can continue to come to the house of the Lord and worship in warmth and praise him for his goodness. I see the deacons are already collecting the offering, so I was going to say we will make good use of showers of blessing. We could sing one verse and then I'll pray. <laughs> one line. Drops now. 
Let us pray. Our kind Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us to your house to worship you. Lord, we thank you for the tithes and offerings that have been given. And Lord, we ask you for the wisdom to help that the money we have contributed can be used to further your, your gospel and hasten your soon coming. In everything that we do, Lord, may we always continue to be thankful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Children, it's your turn. Come on. down to your level so I can tell this story to you. Right. Are you happy to be in church today? Yes. Do you know what day today is? It's the stewardship emphasis day. So, I am going to tell a story about two boys and about their mothers, right? So there were two boys and their mothers. So anybody wants to name one boy? Jaden. Jaden, okay. We are going to name the first boy Jaden and the second boy? James. James, okay. So Jaden and James, if I forget the names, remind me. So first we're going to learn about Jaden. Now, <coughs> Jaden was a very, very naughty boy. He was very naughty. And one day, Jaden went to school and came home with a book which did not belong to him. And his mother saw this book, but the mother did not rebuke Jaden. The mother, instead of rebuking or telling Jaden what you did was wrong, gave him an apple. And the next day Jaden went and brought a cloak. And the mother still did not say anything. She said, did anybody see you? And Jada said, no. And the mother said, well, that's good. And then it went on and on and on. And one day Jada became big. And Jada one day got caught. And he was taken by the police officers. And Jaden told the police officers, can I please speak to my mom? And the police officer said, okay, we can do that. And when Jaden's mom came closer to Jaden, Jaden told mom, come closer, I want to speak to you. And Jaden, what did he do? What do you think he did? his mom's ear? He bit his mom's ear and the mom screamed, oh my ear, my ear. And Jaden said, I am in this situation, I'm going to prison because of you, because you didn't stop me stealing. And unfortunately, Jaden had to go to prison. Now, I'm going to tell the story about James. 
James also was a very, very, very naughty boy. He was very naughty. And James also started stealing money. First he started with a small bill. And then that became a bigger bill. And it became a bigger bill. He started stealing. And nobody knew. He went to school, he went to the canteen, he ate a lot of food, he had many friends, he bought food for his friends, and he was happy. He went to the shop, he bought chewing gum, chocolates, Oreos, and all those sweets, and he enjoyed them. But one day, Jaden's mom came to his room and checked his wallet. And she found out that Jaden had a big bill in his wallet. And mom asked, whose is this? Where did you get this from? And Jaden couldn't speak a word. He was quiet, he was dumbfounded. James, that's right, James. Thank you, Yoyo. So it's James. Yes, so James, now got caught and James mom did not did not stop rebuking him Jaden's mom said what you did was very 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 bad yeah stealing is bad is it good or bad it's bad and Jaden thought James thought thank you James <laughs> James thought this is that this is going to be a very very bad day for me and he is going to get a good beating but do you know what happened any guesses he didn't he didn't okay any other guess he got beaten he got beaten he got beaten he was beaten he went to jail? He went to jail? No. James did not get any beating. James did not go to jail. Instead, his mommy prayed for him. His mommy prayed for him and said, never ever steal again. And if you want something, you ask. And James did not steal from that day ever. And that James is the one who is telling you this Bible story. <laughs> and that happened to me when I was 12 years old. And my mom, she prayed for me. And that was the last day that I stole a single penny. I know mommy is watching online. Thank you, mommy. Thank you for doing that and praying for me. So, the Bible says in Exodus 20 verse 15, Thou shalt not steal. And that is part of being a, a good steward for God. Don't steal. If you need, you need to ask. And your parents would definitely give it if you need it. Thank you, children. Let's go back. Who wants to pray for us before we go? Yes. Jesus, thank you for this beautiful day and guiding us to church. Thank you for this um, big church family and help us to obey and listen to the pastor. Um, Thank you for this. Um, uh, thank you for this beautiful day to guide us and bring us to church. Um, and help us to study well. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 So remember, children, do not steal. Ask. Let's go back to our seats.
that church was an interesting story. I couldn't, uh, I had no idea it could turn like that to the speaker. I have the, um, the honor to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, Sister Sharon already told you that he's come from the Southeast England Conference, uh, but he sent me more detail. Uh, no, normally people send a few lines, Pastor, you know, three lines, and then you follow, you know, you follow again and say, oh, I need more, what about this, can you tell me about that? But he's already given me uh, a page and a half uh, of information, so I, I didn't need to follow up uh, on him. I think he uh, is probably used to this, that, you know, he's going to ask, so here, here it is, you know. So, um, Pastor, oh, here is something that Sister Sharon didn't say, because he said Pastor Todd Frias, so I've got here another name before Todd, okay, so it's Flu... Frilson, Pastor Frilson, Todd Frias, but I think he prefers Pastor Todd Frias. <laughs> is the youngest, uh, is the youngest son of the late Pastor Abraham Frias and of Mrs. Lloyd Frias, a Bible instructor. He grew up in a pastoral family. Uh, he learned to love and serve Jesus from his early age. He was his dad's little helper as they visited churches, preaching, teaching, and promoting the principles of stewardship. Uh, for his dad served as the stewardship director at their local conference in the Philippines. So sometimes there's a saying that we follow the footsteps of our parents. And here we have an example uh, of a a young man following the footsteps uh, of his father. Okay. So from his childhood, it has been his desire and prayer to see members become faithful steward disciples of Jesus. Although it was not his intention to become a pastor like his dad, but God has unique ways of calling. That Todd uh, found himself enrolled in the College of Theology at the Adventist University of the Philippines, and later finished his theological studies in 1996. So immediately after that, he, was, he became a district pastor, and after four months, he was called to teach minor Bible, minor Bible courses at the College of Theology. And in 1999, he accepted an MVS call to assist the Filipino group at Central London Church. So the Filipino group grew uh, through the leadings, the leadings of the Holy Spirit and was eventually organized in 2002 as a church. And you know here we have the Bulgarian church with us. We are one, but the numbers keep growing, and I wonder whether there's a, a similar story you know, being written here. So um, on August of the same year, the SEC, the SEC uh, employed him as part of its pastoral workforce assigned to pastor the Filipino International SDA Church and Maswell Hill SDA Church. So he helped organize the Filipino International Church and the Heathrow International Church and was their pastor until January of 2018. Prior to his appointment as stewardship director in 2015, uh, he served as the Area 6D coordinator on 2013. So you can see that he's given me quite uh, a lot. Uh, and he's happily married uh, to Joy Lopena, and God has blessed them with two lovely daughters, Thea and Jana. But Pastor, you have not traveled with them? No. So they are not here with, with us, but uh, what does he spend and like doing on his spare time? He loves DIY, uh, reading, photography, traveling, and doing missions. So the next voice that you are going to hear after the special item uh, is that of uh, Pastor Todd Frears. Amen, church.
For our meditational song, um, our visitors um, is, are going to um, give us a special item. They came from Birmingham, actually. They're young people, Filipinos as well. So um, their name is Nilsson, Alex, Hannah, and Mart, and they're going to give us the song to rescue the sinner like me.
kingdom above to rescue a sinner like me. He abandoned his throne and his kingdom above to Thank you so much for that wonderful song. I don't know if this group has a name. Do you have a name or is it just a quartet from Truth Seeker? That's a wonderful name. That's a wonderful name. Thank you for that wonder, wonderful song of praise to, to the Lord. Uh, it, it just made me think, when I see these kids, it just made me think how old I am. You know, well, the, the, the parents of these kids were just my you know, colleagues at in, the in, 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 in university back in the Philippines. And now, yes, our children are, have grown up. Um, and we just continue to praise the Lord for uh, God using these children to glorify His wonderful name. Amen. Well, a wonderful Sabbath afternoon to everyone. It's already afternoon, I would say. Uh, it's, it's so wonderful to be back here with you. And uh, also, so glad to be reminded of my last visit here. Uh, yes, it was the cold. Uh, not, now, I think, Sister Sharon, the next time, or if there's a next time, I would say, uh, the next invitation, I would not uh, put it on December. <laughs> I put it on July, probably, or August. But well, anyway, it's, it's always a blessing for me to be back at a church that I have served before. And that was, it's been three years already, isn't it? Three years. Um, when I was last here with you, and so I would like to thank your pastor and uh, the stewardship team or the treasury team for invi inviting me back to minister through God's word to you today. Um, of course, I would like to bring greetings from the South England Conference and from my family. Want me to use that one? Oh, when it's on, yeah. Okay. Um, and of course, from my family. Uh, I thought I could have my family with me this time, but, you know, the calendar of the, our local church doesn't match as my calendar. It's, it's the Pathfinder induction today. And so they could not come with me once again. Um, last week, they were with me in Bristol. So it's, it's a joy for me. You know, when, when the kids are growing up, they, at times they just want to be on their own. At, uh, you know. So it, it's been half a year that I haven't spent the Sabbath with them. Uh, so last Sabbath, I said, can you come with me? And so they... Uh, since there's nothing happening in the local church, so they joined me. But they always say, Daddy, there's something happening in the church. And I'm, I'm happy for that. When the kids say, Daddy, there's something happening in the church, and I want to join, and I want to be in that, I could not say no I, you know, for, for, for that. I want them to enjoy church. I want them to enjoy the relationship with God. And so, well... It's a stewardship emphasis Sabbath. And uh, I hope the message that I have left with you three years ago is something that you would still remember that stewardship is not all about money. It's not all about money. It's about your and my relationship with God. If there's one thing that stewardship is all about, it's all about worship. Amen? Amen. 
And so as we go through our study of the Word of God today, I want you to always remember who is the real focus when stewardship is being discussed, talked about, and as we you know, have this study of the Word today on this special topic of the God first, God first lifestyle or stewardship revival and how we could be revived in these principles that God has for us that we would always tune in our minds into the heart of God. Let us have a word of prayer. Lord, we just want to continue to invite your presence here with us. We know, oh Lord, that uh, our hearts is always centered on ourselves. But we want, oh Lord, we desire that our minds, our hearts be focused, solely fixed on Jesus Christ. And so open our hearts, open our minds, oh God, at this moment. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the last week of November and the first week of December, second week of December is usually given as a focus or emphasis on stewardship. I don't know why the General Conference have, you know, actually picked this day. But for me, and as I would always promote stewardship in this churches in the South England Conference, I would say to them, stewardship emphasis is every Sabbath and every day of the year. Amen? It's not just every last week or every first week of December. But maybe it's, they put it as a special day, as a special week for stewardship focus because it's a time when we think of how we want to renew, you know, our relationship with God. It's towards the end of the year wherein we have experienced God for the past 11 months. And we want to look back and understand how God has been so good to each one of us. And to think of that there's only a month left or less than a month left within this year. How can I give more focus in my connection with God that all my self-centeredness, all my selfishness, all the things that I just want for myself, now I can focus on who God is and who, who He can be for me. The text that was read to us earlier in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, is something that I want to focus the message on uh, this, this afternoon on. If you have your Bibles with you, I want you to open it with me, you know, to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. We all know that this chapter focuses on Solomon's dedication of the temple to God. And so if there's one thing that maybe we could focus on today as we deal on the subject on stewardship, it's not just the focus of the Solomon's temple, or not just the church building, you know, dedication, because I'm sure you have dedicated this building and we would continue to ask God that, you know, God would continue to bless, you know, this building. Uh, but more so, God wants His people to be dedicated and to be connected with Him. And that's why um, I believe this passage is very, very relevant to us today and the very focus and the the, the verse that we have today um, is some sort of God's conversation with Solomon and I believe if Solomon you know were able to hear God's words back then that we would also as a people hear God's message for us to this day and so when, when God said in verse 14, if my people, if the members of Leicester Church, my people, that's, that's one way of God, you know, th th 
that's how much God loves His people. That's how He approaches them. My people. He didn't say, you know, to the child, just to the children of Israel, which sometimes He would say that, but in a more personal way, God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, a very personal, you know, approach, and pray and seek my face, what did God say? And turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Amen. Amen. I know when people approach us this text, we would immediately see that there is that conditional part in this text. But it's always good for us to understand why God would say that. If there's one thing that, you know, yes, it, it, has, it was mentioned a while ago that I love DIY, but you know, actually, Elder Nelty, you know, when, when I come to a church, uh, when you, your, your church leader here are very, very um, organized, you know, I've, I've, I've received several emails all the way from way back, but you know, this week I received even things to, for me to fill in. And so I could not resist myself to filling in those, those things and also giving the, the details that is needed to be there. But usually when I come to a church, you know, they, they don't have that. So they just ask me on the day, Pastor, how do you want us to, to, to introduce you? And I, I would just say with one line, just introduce me as a pastor. That's it. But when churches are very organized like your church here, then I would copy-paste. <laughs> I would copy-paste what is, you know, uh, the introduction of that, that I have in the SEC website. That's where I got that one. And so I have, I have copy-paste on that. And I, I, I did say that I love DIY, but there's also one thing that I love to do, and that's cooking. You know, I love cooking. I love cooking without the recipe. I just want to know, you know, just mix things and, and see how it would turn out. But there's one thing that I have not really mastered. And I don't know, there's a lot of Filipinos here. Um, I've asked for recipes for, we call it puto or the rice cake. Yeah. But for so many attempts, I haven't gotten it right. You know, my, when I went home, my, my, not really my hometown, but the next town where I did study on for, for my primary school, it's known for the rice cake in, in, our, in, in the Philippines. But, and so when I went home, I asked my friends who does and who cook rice cake to give me the recipe. And it wasn't, you know, until I followed it, you know, step by step, that I almost got to how I really wanted it to taste like. I, but I still, I didn't get it right, you know. And that just reminds me, you know, that just reminds me how maybe we as God's people, are actually longing, longing for something more. Just like how I would say I would love that rice cake to taste like. I want it to be perfect. I want it more. I want it to, to taste in a way that would please my taste bud. And in so many ways as a people, we also want to experience more in our spiritual life in our church life we want new spiritual refreshing we even want personal revival right we want to be revived uh, we want to understand how we could even please god but good enough god has his, his own personal recipe for
for revival in our hearts. Amen? Amen. He has His way of saying things, of directing us. A step-by-step -step guidance on how we could truly experience personal and even church revival for us to be able to really respond and put God first. And He has written it down for us. He has written it down in the very verse that we have just read that says, If my people, if my people will, do you, do you understand that? If my people will, then what will happen? I will hear from heaven. If my people will respond, if my people will acknowledge who God really is, who I really am, and the Word of God, you know, who I really am, then from heaven, I will continue to bless and respond to them. And I believe that when this recipe of God is followed precisely as it should be, when it is put into practice, then it will result in a new spirit that will enable each one of us to soar into a spiritual region that may be unknown to us. Something that maybe we have not even experienced uh, for, for ourselves. So many times when we, as, you know, even in the church life, when we talk of revival, we are talking so much of, maybe we could say it's, it's the man's viewpoint of how we wish we could revive ourselves, how we could be active for ourselves. We are always seeking on that. That we, most of the time, become self-centered. But I would say, just for this moment, I know I only have less than 30 minutes here, but just for this moment, let us seek, let us seek for ourselves God's viewpoint when it comes to revival. Let us seek the throne of God. That really is God's viewpoint when it comes to, to His will for us. What is God's desire from this text? You know, what is God's desire? God's desire here, right from the very first line of it, says what? If my people, if my people, then... There, here we could see how God has been waiting, how God has been willing. And He is so much for a, a long time, He is actually longing to send a new spirit to His people, to each one of us who are here. For a long time, from that probably, if, if we would be honest to ourselves, and, and we, have, we could accept it, from the time or even before the time we accept the gospel message, God has been longing to actually spend that wonderful moment with you and with us. <coughs> However, if we will look at the text, we could also see even though God's desire is for us to turn our hearts to Him, for us to spend our life with Him, yet He will not overrule our own will. He respects us so much as a person. He respects us so much as His creation that He will not overrule our will. Despite of the fact that, you know, of course, revival won't happen without Him. Really? Isn't it? Without Him, revival will not happen. And yet, we could see that revival is very, very conditional. When God says here, if my people, it tells us that there are certain conditions that are met 
certain result, you know, for certain results to follow. But it is good for us to understand the very first part of it. That God longs to send revival in His church and in His people. He's, you know, he, he wants us to be connected to Him. If we would look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, we are told He is not willing. God is not willing at any point for any one of us here to what? To perish. If we would just think about that, that should allow us to get to our senses and to understand that personal revival is not a miracle that can just happen to us. Personal revival and the church revival, for us to be able to really put God first for where He should be, is for us to understand that revival is God's promised response to the conditions that are met by His people. When we met, when we meet God's conditions, when we understand, when we start to acknowledge for who God really is in our life, then, as God have designed it for each one of us, He says what? If my people who are called by my name will what? will humble themselves. It is God's design for each one of us to live for God. And that's why he said there what? If my people who are called by my name, he is the very first one who made an action. He is the very first one to take that initiative, to call us to himself. He is the first one, you know, of course, he is, he is the one who made us. He is the one who promised to provide us with everything. But he also have made that calling for each one of us. But despite of that, God's design for revival is not just for him just to call us and that things would happen. No. There if we would look at it, the real story behind any revival in the history of, I would say, even Leicester Church, God's Adventist Church, the revival that took place in the past centuries, it always begins when God's people themselves become convicted. That they have neglected God. That they have forgotten God. That they have forgotten to ask God's fresh anointing each day. If we would read the history of the many great awakenings in the history of the Christian church we would know that it would always begin with a man or with a woman who becomes so desperate for the Lord. It would always begin from one person who is actually seeking and have become desperate and have sought for God's fresh anointing. Well, Psalm 92 verse 10 tells us, But you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox, and I have been anointed with fresh oil. We all know that God's anointing, you know, God's calling and God's blessing is new every morning, right? But and so it's God's people when we seek God and when we ask God you know to 
Give us that fresh anointing each day. Then, surely, as God have designed it, and even as God have desired it to be, God desires for us to be revived. God desires us to put Him first in our lives. But also God have designed that for that to happen, we need to what? We need to crave for God. We need to also have that deep desire for us, for, for the Lord. And that we are with take to ourselves and say to ourselves, I know it is only God that I needed in my life. A few weeks back, there was a survey. I don't know if you've read of it. There was a survey that, they, that came up that only 46% of England and Wales now says that they are Christians. And it is very alarming, isn't it? And I remember reading in one of the thread that, you know, social media that I'm into, one of my pastor friend did say there, well, there was a book here in England that was published as well, that we love Jesus, we don't just love the church. But, of course, even with the title of the book, and even what's you know, mentioned in the book, that is, there's an irony in that. How could we love Jesus and not love his people? Or probably, he's just trying to create some, you know, discussion on it by saying there must be something happening in the church that makes them unlove the church, but still love Jesus. But despite of that survey, what God is saying to us is if we ourselves are convicted that we simply needed God, then that should help us to understand. That should help us to understand that God's problem today is not with those lost people in the world. I, I, uh, God's problem today and what he's, he's pointing to us really is despite of what's happening around the world, yes, the culture around the world is not what we as Christians subscribe to, there's a decline morally. There's a, a big influence of, of the world and the secular world into the lives of even God's people. And yes, we may, we may even say that the world around us, and even that survey says that we may think that they are godless. Some are, you know, Gnostics, atheists. But... There's one thing that we have to understand here. That from the text itself, from God's call and God's desire for us to be revived and for us to turn our back, you know, for, for our faces back to Him, is that God is actually revealing one real issue here. Now maybe... The real problem is not with the people outside the church. But the problem is with us who are in the church. Or as Jesus once said, you know, that we should not try to get a small splinter out of someone else's eye until we first remove the large beam from our own eye. God's design for revival always begin with God's people. It doesn't begin with those who do not know God and who doesn't want to claim that they believe in God. If we want to see revival in the world 
And if we want to see the world coming to God, then there must be something, a response that needs to take place from God's own people. And that's why in the text that we have, God doesn't only have a desire that He tells us. God also it doesn't only have God's uh, design for His people to actually come to the point that they would understand and acknowledge that they needed God and that we needed to come back to Him. But God also has a demand that He asked from His own people. What does He say? He said, If my people who are called by my name will what? Humble themselves. If my people who are called by my name will pray. If my people who are called by my name will seek my face. And if my people who are called by my name will turn away from their wicked ways. Then. Then. Only then. That true revival would happen in his church. True revival will happen on every individual in the church who are claiming to be my followers. God's demand begins with a call for his hum people to humble ourselves. For us to recognize and for us to confess that our need is to seek him in everything. To seek Him. And that's why when it comes to stewardship, the theme you know, that we all was always promote is to put God first. If we do not confess God, if we do not seek Him first, then what will happen to us? We will be living our lives through how we think we should be living it. It will just be our selfish heart that would always come out of the hands that we do, you know, in everything that we do. And that's why as Christians, we must be on constant vigil to avoid the temptation of spiritual pride and self-centeredness. But rather, we must take to ourselves the humility of Jesus Christ, which involves a broken spirit before the Lord. Amen. We need to come to God always. And that's why when God calls His people to pray, I just wonder how many of us would really come to God to pray. In the stewardship re uh, revival materials that was released by the General Conference to all the churches, I, and I hope you are, you've been following on that, prayer is first and foremost. One of the first things that every stewardship leader, every elder, or every person should always you know, encourage each other or everyone in the church is for us to put first, you know, put God first and to spend the, every, the first moment of each day with God. If we could not do that, how can we ask God to lead us and guide us throughout the day? And that's why God is calling His people to pray. And and when God asks us to pray, it doesn't just mean a mere res, you know, uh, recitation of prayers. But it is an earnest calling out in God or to, to God. Too many Christians today or too many Christians' prayer testimonies can easily be summed up today with up to four words from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. That says what? That we do not wrestle. We do not wrestle. But every true revival, if we really want to be revived ourselves, 
If we, you know, every true revival in history is always born in the place of prayer. We read of the early church in Acts chapter 4, verse 31, that says what? When they had prayed. What happened to the place? The place where they were assembled was what? Was shaken. When they had prayed, the place where they assembled was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. Church, God desires that we come to God in prayer. That we seek His Spirit. You know, that we ask the Lord to fill our hearts and to fill our lives. And that is what God demands of us. God demands that we seek His face. As Jeremiah said in, in Jeremiah 29, 13, I'm sure you know all of this, isn't it? What does it say? Jeremiah 29, 13, You will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. The problem is, we want God, but we do not seek God. That's why we do not find Him. And when we even come to Him, yes, we pray. I, you know, I, I, w I would not say that people do not pray. We do pray. But so many times we pray half-heartedly. That we do, not even, we do not even believe that God would answer the prayer that God, he, we, we, we sent to the throne of grace. Church, when we search for God, let us believe with all of our hearts that He is listening to us. Because if we could just think of you know, His word to Solomon, it is Him, it is God Himself, who demands that we seek Him. If He demanded to us that we seek Him, will He not answer back to us and respond to our prayers? Of course He will. Of course He will. And that's why if believers today spend as much time seeking His face as we do seeking His hands, we would be on the way to revival. But whether we are be honest to ourselves or not, much of our prayings today seems to be so consumed with seeking just something from God's hand. We're just seeking, Lord, bless me with this and bless me with that. Lord, I need this and I need that. Lord, I've got some things I needed. Lord, I am sick. I needed healing. Yes, we need to come to God for those. But it's not only those things that we needed from the Lord. When we pray, my dear brothers and sisters, we need to seek Him. We need to seek for Him. We need to ask God Himself for our lives. And God even demands one more thing. That when we you know, seek Him, that we should also result to turning away from our wicked ways. So many times our prayers are not answered because we would seek God and ask God for something. And yet, we would still live on the life that we wanted to for ourselves. We don't want to release ourselves from the bondage of sin. We don't want to release ourselves from all those secret sins that we have. And still, we want God to answer our prayer. Sin 
that is unconfessed is one of the greatest obstacle for a personal revival. And that's why Solomon even reminded us in Proverbs 28, verse 13. He who covers his sins will not, what's the word? Prosper. He who covers his sin will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. We have to note that it is not simply enough for us to say sorry or be sorry for the sins that we have done. But we need to confess our sins. And we must forsake them. Do you remember the story of the prodigal son? Do you remember all the different stories of the, the Bible characters? It's not just enough to come to God and have even your offering. God even says, you know what? If you come to me with all your offerings and yet you still have some differences with your brothers, Leave the offering, the, you know, go back and settle your differences. My dear brothers and sisters, it is always good to listen to the word of God. That to obey the word of God is better than all the sacrifices that we offer to God. We can never bribe God. Well, anyway, everything in this world belongs to Him. Why would he need it for? God, what God desires is your heart and my heart. Amen. What God desires for us today and what he wish is for him to be delighted with how we would respond to his calling. And that's why when he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and forsake you know, their evil ways, then what will happen? <laughs> then I will hear from heaven and then I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Amen. God's delight is so simple. God's delight is to forgive your sin and my sin. Why? It is just because He wants, you know, He wants to give us more than what we have. More than what we asked Him for. When, you know, He delights to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all the sins so that we might appropriate all that the cross of Christ involves. So that as far as we might personally be concerned, his death would not be in vain. I like the songs that Nielsen you know, have sung and the group have sung earlier. It all gets us back to understanding of why Christ needs to, to come down to this world and give his life as a ransom for many. In our lives, we should not put all those things in vain. As God delights more in healing our hearts, in healing our homes, in healing our churches, yes, God is willing, He is waiting, and He is longing to be faithful to each one of us because we have responded to His call. If my daughter and I have a misunderstanding and something had broken our connection, our fellowship, for sure it would be my longing and her longing as well for restoration to happen, right? 
What do you think? How would I react if my daughter would come to me in humility and ask for forgiveness and say, Dad, I'm so sorry for what I've done. What? You know? And as I look at, his, at her face, she's longing for that love. What do you think? Or how do you think should I would react? Would I react and say, well, you did it? You know? No. Of course, I will forgive her. I will welcome her with an open arm, with an open heart. And no wonder why the Bible continues to reveal that our Heavenly Father will do so much more for us. Our great God, who, who can see and who, would, who knows when, when there's a small sparrow that would fall on the ground, how much more it is for Him not to know and not to reveal His love for His children like us, whom He has given His life for. Church, as we meditate on the fact that personal revival is what we needed today so that we can continue to put God first. And while we know that God is at work already, but there is that conditional part there, conditional part that may hinder us to fully experience his life on us. That if we do not respond to him, then we would not, you know, it's almost like if we do not respond on this condition, we are actually closing the windows of heaven or not allowing the windows of heaven to, to open for his blessing to come upon us. But God's personal recipe here is so simple. It's so simple. And it's not so difficult on our part. He simply calls us to follow His direction. To humble ourselves. To pray. And to forsake our sins. Church, we often forget that the work of revival in this world always begins with God's own people first. Because it is with God's own people that God must first renew His connection and His work, especially on winning souls for Christ, or before the winning souls for Christ can take place. The Bible tells us who are called by my name. And God is the one who calls us out from among the world. And being Christians means that we are meant to stand out from the rest of the world. That's why that's why we must live differently than the world because we value different things. We value an eternal promise and we value a different lifestyle than the world. Church, the God-first lifestyle is what we needed to take to ourselves. And God is calling us at this moment to dedicate ourselves first to Him. Then, we will be able to do what God desires for us to do. To reach out to the world around us. To even fill this church with God's people. And the next time that I would come here, my dear sister, it will be warmer. Why? Because this church will be full. 
You know what? The best heater that there would be in the world is people. When you're next with, you know, to someone, it will be warmer. And this church will be warmer when it's full of people. Saved from the world. Why? Because the people who are here today have put in their, uh, put God place in their life, have surrendered themselves to God, and real revival have taken place in the, personally as a church. I did ask Sister Sharon a while ago, how many church members do we have here? And I was told there are about 200, 250. I say, this church, this church could sit, on my estimate, more than 500. Right? And so if every one of that member will be revived, would surrender themselves to God, would pray on a daily basis to ask, asking God, Lord, what do you want me to do today for Leicester? city then God and as we seek God's face then God would heal you personally then God would heal us a church community then we would be able to bring healing to this city which is what God desires church I want you to listen to this song that our brother Nilsson would sing to us today and reflect on what God desires for you. And what God desires for you to do. And how God would want you. And what God demands from you. As an answer to his call. His name, there is no other name. The one who is eternally the same. There is no other name. The first and last beginning and the end. He was the king who made the common man his friend there is no other name let every tongue proclaim and sing the name of Jesus magnify and praise the name of Jesus no other name but Jesus There's power in the precious name of Jesus Jesus, Messiah, King of kings and Lord of lords He created all there is with his own hands And yet the smallest needs he understands There is no other name The one who said I am the great I am and then he gave himself a sacrifice for man. There is no other name. Let every tongue proclaim and sing the name of Jesus. 
Jesus, magnify and praise the name of Jesus. No other name but Jesus, this power in the precious name of Jesus. Jesus. Forever he shall reign as King of kings, Lord of all and every living thing. From now on we'll worship him and praise the name of Jesus. Magnify and praise the name of Jesus. No other name but Jesus. There's power in the precious name of Jesus. Jesus, forever he shall reign as King of kings. Lord of all and every living thing From now on we'll worship Him And praise the name of Jesus 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 just want to thank pastor very much for the message yes. and I hope you remember that text second chronicles verse 7 chapter 7 and verse 14 14 thank you very much pastor. thank you and as we go we are going to have lunch downstairs so that we are back for 2 30 because pastor has a presentation for this afternoon and we want him to get back safely. He has a long distance to travel. So please come um, quickly, have lunch with us, and come back for 2.30. 2.30. So to close, we are going to sing hymn 316, Live Out Thy Life Within Me. Thank you.
with humble hearts, O God, we come to you. We thank you for being and speaking to us here today. Lord, we know that there is nothing that we can do that would even glorify your wonderful name if our hearts are not submitted to you. So help us, O oh dear Heavenly Father, through the humility of Jesus Christ, may we also humble ourselves before you each day. And through the Spirit that Christ has promised to give us, as you have changed our hearts, and as you have given us a new heart, May it be, O oh Lord, that we would always long for the Spirit to speak to us each day. So that in everything that we do, we will give honor and glory to our Father, to our Creator, and to the Sustainer of our life. Lord, for everyone who's here today and those who may be watching, O oh Lord. May you speak to us today. If it needs, O oh Lord, for a simple prayer, for us to confess our sins before you, Lord, move our hearts at this moment. So that we will not be leaving this place the same person as we have come in today. But rather, O oh Lord, we will be leaving this place a changed man, a changed woman, a changed child of yours. So that we will be able to live the true purpose that you have meant for our lives. As we go back to our respective homes and even speak to our own family, to our neighbors, to our friends, may they hear a different and a new us, a new me, a new person whose words would only be coming from God's throne of grace. And it is the mercy of God that will be heard and that will be felt through the lives that we'll be living from this day onwards. Lord, dismiss us with your blessing. May it be that it is only the life of Christ that would be reflected in us from this day onwards because there is no other name that needs to be heard in this city, O Lord, than the name of Jesus and in his name. We ask for your blessing. Amen. Amen. Six eight eight six hundred eighty eight. Surely, surely.